And then um, I just want to make sure that she did sign out, sign, send folks if something about if they have problems signing in. She sent out the link. We, but I if you hear know. from anybody. Yeah, I sorry. won't know until we start webinar. If we don't see attendees. Then okay. We'll for them. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. We're going to be live in three, two, and one. All right. Take it away, Angela. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Scores Poetry Summit, Words in Action. My name is Angela Bailey. I'm coming to you from the Bay Area, America Scores Bay Area, where we work with over 60 schools in order to provide free soccer, poetry, and service learning programming for the youth. Across the country, we're in 11 different cities and help to provide programming for over 12,000 young poet athletes. We call them poet athletes because they are learning life lessons and learning how to express themselves on the field, off the field, everywhere. And that's the point. Very honored to welcome you to the summit today. We have an incredible lineup of speakers. I am going to let Hamza Al Hadari take it away, one of our very own America Scores Bay Area crew. I uh, want to say a very quick thank you to the organizers of this summit, Alicia Yano, Tamsin Smith, Dean Radar, and our ED, Colin Schmidt. And a thank you to the folks who are friends at the SAC Brand Group and also SOMA Equity Partners for helping us to bring our community together and provide for this platform. So without further ado, take it away, Hansa. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angela. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, David Sullivan. I'm very thrilled to be here and share this next hour with you. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by welcoming everyone and thank you for joining us. I hope this session will be inspiring and uh, riveting for, for many of you. David, I'd like to give you the proper introduction, but I would, I'll, I'll give it to you to share a little bit more about you. I will, I will start by saying David Sullivan is an author, a professor, a poet, a husband, a father, and a man of many interests. Uh, just before we started this session live, we were chatting about your children and what they're up to today. And I think children may be an unfair term to, to title them with, but I'll let you speak to that a little bit and introduce our audience to yourself a little more, please. Uh, thanks, Hamza, and, and thanks, Angela. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, I've been teaching at Cabrillo Community College for around 25 years, and uh, writing and publishing poetry almost as long, a little bit later um, when I started. Um, yeah, my kids have become kind of uh, activists and, and one is fighting uh, line three in Northern Minnesota in the, in the bitter cold. Um, so that's what Hans and I were talking about earlier. Um, it's amazing how much you learn from, I mean, that's one of the great things about teaching, how much young people bring to the table and uh, their creativity, their dynamism, their activism is really inspiring for me to see. Wonderful. We're going to dive more into that through writing, translating poetry, and your own writing. Before we get started, David, I would like to ask you for a big favor. I'm a huge fan of your poetry, and I have, I've read two of your books today. Uh, not today, but to the day. Um, would you kindly start us off with a poem before we dive into your resume? Sure, yeah. Let me uh, read a poem from my second book about uh, Iraq. Um, I kind of got pulled into writing about Iraq because my students started to write about it. They were veterans coming back, both from Iraq and from Af Afghanistan. And um, as I talked to them, I realized how little I really knew about the war and how differently it was being covered by the media than the stories I was getting from my students. And once I began to write poems trying to wrestle with the Iraq war, I realized I really didn't understand anything about the Iraq perspective. And it was much harder to find in the media, um, but through reaching out through social media and other uh, platforms, uh, I was able to make some friends with Iraqis. Um, so my first book about the Iraq war is Every Seed of the Pomegranate, um, which came out a while ago, this book um, from Tabat Bach. And that is half in the voice of US soldiers and uh, citizens and half in the voice of Iraqi soldiers and citizens. The next book that's going to come out um, 
probably the next couple months is called Black Butterflies Over Baghdad. And I'm gonna read the last poem in the book, which is a dialogue poem with an interrogator and a Iraqi artist responding. It's called Interrogation, and it's inspired by the paintings by Sirwan Baran. Why have you hidden the man's face? The paintings of the horse, not the man. Why is his cuff frayed? Does he represent the poor? He's a farmer, he is poor. Why did you paint the horse with nostrils flared? Horses widen their nostrils when smelling. And why are its teeth bared? It's lipping up the fig from the man's hand. Why does the horse's cheek strain? Its muscles are working, extending around the brown fist of the fig. You've shown the ribs of its chest. Yes, a horse has ribs. Its eye seems crazed. Crazed is in the eye of the beholder. But it looks out of the canvas at us. While I painted, the horse noticed me. Then you admit it's about duplicity? It's about a horse, a fig, a man. You've left out the artist. I try not to be in my work. So you admit you're in hiding. I admit it's a painting. Do not leave the country in case you're wanted for further inquiry. Then do not take the country from me. What was that? Or the horse, or the man. Do you want to go hungry? I want to grow kinder. Thank you very much for starting us off with that poem. Uh, David, I, I wanted to sort of segue this conversation into two parts and I wanted to talk one part about you as an author and a poet and then the second part talk about the common space between poetry and art in two different languages. And let us start with knowing a little bit about who David Sullivan is. Where were you born? Where is home now? Just to familiar, to make our audience familiar with who. Yeah, I've, I've traveled a bit, so I, um... My dad was a graduate student in Champaign-Urbana. So that's where I was actually born and lived for my first six years. Then um, he spent a year at Stanford. So I was in Palo Alto for a year. Then he got the full-time job at Dartmouth College. So I went to uh, Norwich, Vermont, which is really where I consider home. That's I did you know, my adolescence and growing up. Um, so I still feel like a Vermonter. When it starts to turn cold, I, I want the snow to start falling. Have you gotten your mitts? similar to Bernie Sanders from Vermont yet? <laughs> I don't have the Bernie mitts. <laughs> no, I love the meme going around. Um, then I uh, went to the University of Chicago for undergrad. Um, uh, growing up, I also spent a year in Vienna. My dad was on sabbatical. Um, then I went to um, graduate school in Southern California and then moved to Santa Cruz where I've been, you know, for the last 25 years, with one year as a Fulbright scholar teaching in Xi'an, China, and with my family, uh, they're now teens. Um, yeah, so I've been able to travel around a bit. I have not yet to gone to Iraq, though my Iraqi friends keep saying, "You have to come. <laughs> we have good food." <laughs> maybe, maybe you and I will will go on a flight together. Oh, uh, I would love that. Have a good time, uh, David. When did you when did you start writing poetry, and what attracted you to it? Um, well, I started writing, as many adolescents did, I started writing when I read Walt Whitman. Um, and so I, I think I wrote bad Walt Whitman for a while. And then uh, I always kept writing poetry. I, I never thought myself very good at it. Um, I kept my own kind of private journals, but I didn't publish much. I, I was the editor of a literary journal at the University of Chicago. Um, and so I published a little bit while I was there, but it really wasn't until I finished graduate school and returned to Santa Cruz and joined a poetry group, um, and was approached about possibly publishing a book. And that's when I started to pull together my poems and, uh, Strong Armed Angels got published, um, ah, 15 years ago now. Um, 
And then it began to kind of snowball. Once I got feedback on the writing and that it mattered to people, it empowered me to write more. Um, and I tell that to my students all the time. I say, to begin to put your stuff in print will change your relationship to it because for a while, it's just for you. <laughs> and it suddenly begins to have this resonance in ways that you can't even predict. Um, I wrote about a stillborn child in my first book that we had and, and you know, painful, hard poems to write. And a former student from 15 years beforehand found me and contacted me because she dealt with a stillbirth as well. And that kind of ripple effect, it's just kind of uh, amazing to watch what can happen when you put words into the world and you don't know who they're gonna strike or resonate with. And the same thing's true with writing about Iraq. Um, I really felt that I was, I was um, on thin ice writing about things I really didn't understand, um, trying to articulate things uh, that are very hard that soldiers have gone through. And really the response of hearing a soldier, one soldier came back to me, a soldier student, and he read the book and he said, can you change the name of the soldier in that story to my name because that's my story. And, and those kind of responses begin to shift what the writing can do and have opened me up to write more about things in the world, even stretching you know, beyond my own borders and, and language abilities um, and let myself be educated in the process. Um, the Iraqis have been so forthcoming, telling me stories. Uh, there's uh, a man I went to Utah, he worked as a translator with the US troops um, and uh, it, Yusuf Altimimi. And it's just extraordinary what people will be willing to divulge and entrust you with um, when they feel like you're doing honor to their stories. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. You touched up on, you touched up on it just a little bit, but I wanna make it a little more clear. I'm one, I am someone who aspires to be a poet one day and I've been writing. You are a poet. I've read your work, Hamza. <laughs> myself mostly, or I share it with close friends. And I'm sure there are others, many like me, who are in that boat. What What was it for you? I mean, I know you said you joined a poetry group in Santa Cruz and that sort of uh, made your poetry blossom a little more, made you more mm -hmm. comfortable with coming out with it. What, what other aspect, what was it that emotionally maybe clicked for you at one point and you said, when I write, everyone is going to hear it. Oh, I still don't say that. No, I still feel like a fraud um, trying things out and, and totally scared of falling on my face. Um, so yeah, no, there's not that confidence. There, there's, it's still always new. Um, That's probably what makes it so good. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think part of it was when I was writing early on, I was trying to do what I saw other poets do. And I was kind of impressed by that. It took a while to realize that it's not a performance, that actually, if I can get out of the way and empty myself and listen well to the world, to another person, to a book I'm reading, um, that's when the poems start to come through. And I, I started to realize, oh, it's so much not about ego. I mean, I've said this about some of my poems. I didn't write that poem. This one came to me. And I, you know, I, it sounds like false humility, but I dreamt a poem where I just got up in the morning and wrote as fast as I could in my journal before it left. Um, and those feel like gifts. And I think we're kind of practicing to be open enough and receptive enough to receive the gifts. Absolutely, thanks very much. Uh, David, you are the Santa Cruz County Poet Laureate, and that is a big honor. What are some of the steps that you had to take to, um, to be the Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz County? Well, it's a two-year position. Uh, I believe I'm like the seventh uh, to hold it. Um, so it's the Santa Cruz Arts Council and Poetry Santa Cruz uh, elects the new Poet Laureate for the two-year position. Um, and so I didn't do it. They came to me and said, are you willing to be the next Poet Laureate? Um, and really appreciative to the group and to Danusha Lameris, a wonderful poet. If you get a chance to read her, she's an astonishing writer and, and a great person. 
um, who was the last poet laureate. Um, it's strange times to be a poet laureate. You think of, you know, going to schools, gathering people together, reading poems in the gardens. Um, uh, the poet laureates in the past have done things like outreach to a prison program. Ellen Bass started the prison program as poet laureate. Um, one person reached out to the homeless population. Uh, Dunusha started the Hive Poetry Radio Collective. Um, they still do readings in the area. Um, I had the strange thing to have, have my initial idea was to combine art and poetry, local artists and local poets. And so well, I'll just share, um, see if I can go screen share and share the poster from it. Um, is the poster with the child up on your screens? Is that yes. Yeah. Um, and so basically I said, well, why don't I combine my interest in art? I've written about art. I've written about Iraqi artists. Um, that's been one of the inspirations and featured in this uh, latest book. And so Agents of Change is a collaborative art and poetry project where people submit artwork, uh, like this is Janet Fine's uh, piece, and then other people choose to write poems about it, up to two pieces of artwork and up to two poems. And it's really just getting going. We have on the website probably 25 pieces of art and two poems so far. Um, and the idea is that at some point, when things open up post COVID, we will um, feature the artwork and poems side by side in art galleries and stage a series of readings. And ideally reach out um, to have this be bilingual, uh, both in Spanish and English and uh, reach schools and at different levels, uh, high schools, elementary schools, uh, both for the art and for the poetry. So we'll cast the net as wide as we can and see who's willing to participate. And ideally it'll be celebratory <laughs> next um, fall and spring series of readings and art shows around poetry and art and the connections between them. Beautiful. That, that gets me to my segue here. I wanna, I know you've been involved with multi-language projects um, that are not necessarily your native language or not languages you're fluent in. And I wanna transition here to your work with Iraqi artists and artists from other countries as well. Do you have a poem you'd like to share with us as, in this, as we segue to our next theme of conversation here? Um, well, let me look through. Um... One of the interesting things is initially when I started to learn about Iraq, um, it was first some of my students, I had some Iraqi students, and then they connected me with some Iraqi poets. And uh, Adnan al Sayyid, who lives in London now, um, said, I have these poems that Abbas Kadim has translated into English, but I really want to make them poems that work in English. So will you work with him on that? And so we worked together on that project. Um, from there, I began to also have contact with uh, artists uh, like Hiba Jamil, who lives up in Seattle. Um, and you know, their art often is you know, strongly evocative uh, pieces. And I felt kind of moved to try and uh, work with them and to create poems that are either in the voice of the artist, uh, like Hibba Jamil, um, or to try to imagine my way into what's being depicted in the artwork itself. Um, let me show, this is a uh, poem called Tear, and it's based on um, these amazing collages by Hadair Hussein Radi. Um, forgive my pronunciation. Um, I, I correspond with these people mostly through email. So I realize when I have to speak, I'm like, I have no idea how to pronounce their names. I'm just going to show an image here to get an idea of uh, his work. Is that showing up on your screens? Yeah. And so he will combine, oops, sorry about that. He will combine images uh, from Iraq from, uh, and then images from Western media. And so there are these powerful kind of uh, contrasting images. Uh, the boy heating here, as far as I can tell, marmalade bread, and the other boy is holding a broken light bulb. Um, and they're spliced together. Um, 
and the kind of incredible work that he does to try and kind of awaken the disparities, the inequities in our world um, in a very personal way, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a powerful image of uh, these boys. And if I can scroll to it, I'll see if I can find uh, the poem I wrote about his work. Um, this is called Tear. Is that still up on your screens? Can you see the poem? Yes. Yeah. Based on the collages by Heder Hussein Radi. I tear photographs, splice events from the outside world onto those in Iraq. So the smoke canister launched at protesters arcs past the rip of paper into a rainbow that lands in the colorful US. So a man raising a fist against the beetle-like line of armed military police raises his twin hand over the rim of the Grand Canyon. When you look, you can't tell which was torn, whether the photograph is only half Iraq or whether the overlaid photo stock shot was the one that was destroyed. Beautiful and powerful. Thank you very much for sharing. And I love uh, Haider's art with that too. That is the blending of images is absolutely powerful. Uh, David, what caught your interest? What got you to dive into this culture, to dive into this other far part of the world at first? And I wonder how much close you are to it now since you started. Well, I think part of it was I had a political science father and I grew up in the 60s, born in 1960. I had the images of the Vietnam War, the Vietnam body bags, we had a draft dodger living above our garage. Um, my father was going to things like the Democratic Convention in 1967 and writing about it. So it was kind of part of my childhood was kind of the wrestling with the Vietnam War, with uh, civil rights, with the unrest. And in some ways, you know, between Black Lives Matter and, and the virus and, and the kind of new knowledge of the inequities in our world, it feels like we're returning to that time in some ways. Um, maybe with even more urgency, considering how fractured we are and how necessary it is to be activists in terms of you know, climate change, as well as just understanding the suffering of other people that are, are, are dealing with. So I think that's part of the reason. Uh, when my students started to write about their experiences of soldiers they'd lost in, in Iraq, um, I was moved by them. It was quite a leap to begin to actually start writing about it. Um, and, and like I said earlier, the, the first poem actually came in the voice of an angel and it came at night and it really basically said, you've only just started. <laughs> you have no idea what you're in for. Um, and I took it to my group and my group said, well, <laughs> you better keep going then. Um, and then I met Brian Turner and he did a reading here. Um, probably one of the most fa famous uh, Iraq vet poets in the US and, and a great man. He's become a friend over time. Uh, he wrote a blurb on the back of this new book. And uh, I'll just show the picture of the uh, book as well. Um, that's Black Butterflies Over Baghdad, the uh, cover of it. Um, when will that book uh, be out? Uh, they haven't given me a release date. They're talking three or four months from now. Uh, Ghassan Gaib is the artist of this um, butterfly picture. Um, and we actually worked together on an art book that we created a while ago. Um, wonderful artist, um, incredible He's in artist. LA, right? He's what? Based in LA now? I think so, yeah. San Gaib, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it really was being kind of pulled into this and then realizing, oh, as, as foreign it is to me, that if this is what's happening, and this is what, you know, I was involved a little bit in the anti-Iraq uh, protests. We went up into San Francisco. Um, as we got deeper into the war, I realized just how little I knew and understood about it. And those personal stories um, that my students were telling me made me realize how much I needed to understand the Iraqi viewpoint. And that's been the big place of growth. And it's interesting. My first book was half and half. This one's almost entirely about Iraqis experiences or in the voices of Iraqis who have talked to me and, and told to me. And it includes a middle section, about a third of the book are co-translations. Even though I don't speak Arabic, 
I've worked with poets whose English is good enough to help me or with uh, my friend Abbas Kadim uh, to co-translate that work and try to make that bridge. There's been some publication of Iraqi poets in the US, but not a lot. And it's such a rich, I, the other thing is just kind of blowing my mind to wrestle with this poetry, to begin to look back at the history of Iraqi poetry, the depth of Arabic. Um, it, it's an astonishing, even in translation, it's, it's astonishing work. Um, and it's just opened me up to other ways of expression, um, a willingness to kind of use wild metaphors. Um, uh, Arabic love poetry is the most powerful thing. Um, but there's also a use of repetition over and over again um, in these kind of really astonishing ways. Um, maybe I can just read one of those poems. Please do. Um, this is a poem by uh, Kadem Kanhar, and uh, this is one I co-translated with Dr. Um, Abbas Kadim. Let's see if I can pull it up. Is that showing up, we Iraqis? Yes. Um, one of the first poems that we worked on together was this one, and, and he, I, I've gotten to know Kadem. Um, he's in Baghdad. He has some heart troubles. He's part of what he's called the um, Ministry of Culture Without Arms. And they basically read poems in public settings, uh, abandoned hospitals, um, an active minefield, um, in the back of an ambulance. And we'll stage these readings to kind of um, highlight the suffering and what's gone on in Iraq. Um, this is called We Iraqis. We Iraqis see the tattooed arms of American soldiers emerge from helicopters to throw pamphlets onto our rooftop sleeping women. We Iraqis eat tribalism for breakfast in cracked bowls placed there by our mothers. We Iraqis make our doors from iron so we can rust behind them. We Iraqis fire bullets at the sky to mourn one of us who has killed, died and accidentally kill another. We Iraqis fight over roosters that fight to draw blood. We Iraqis fight back flinching when checkpoint dogs rub their snouts in our crotches. We Iraqis plant graveyards next to our houses. We Iraqis run laps around humanitarian aid trailers. We Iraqis rub shoulders only when we lift narrow coffins. We Iraqis count the dead with the same fingers that collected bullet casings in our childhoods. We Iraqis don't remove skulls off public park fences even after they've been picked clean by birds. We Iraqis wash our hands before we eat food and use the same soap to scrub them free of blood. We Iraqis extract decayed years like bad teeth and queue up before mass graves. We Iraqis wait for buses by summer hot concrete blast walls like soaked shoes waiting to dry. We Iraqis use guns for pillows, explosive paste for blankets. We Iraqis are worms crawling the pomegranates of the world. Powerful the <laughs> from that took me back for sure. Um, we, you know, when we talk about poetry, it's a form of art and a form of expression. And it, it's often more powerful when it's being spoken for someone else. And this actually has inspired me to share a piece of something that I had written. And I would like to ask you about maybe how your, your experience with that was. Mm. But in a long poem that I'd written a while ago, part of it I say, I'm passionate about, excuse me, sorry. I'm passionate about life, for it echoes my voice. My voice is loud and clear, not because it's mine. It's loud and clear for it speaks for those who are left to decline. And I found that here as I have a platform, as I'm able to sit here and chat with you or share stage in the past and be able to reach 
thousands of people at once. That's what really enabled me to do the work that I'd done and write the things that I had written. For you, joining a, a, a language or a culture or speaking for a, a culture uh, that's foreign to you, what were some of the biggest motivations to do that? And then what are some of the biggest benefits that you, whether you personally um, saw or benefits that you feel like affected those who you write about or speak about positively? And, and I would add too, and what are the biggest risks? <laughs> biggest risks, of course. Um, uh, yeah, what's extraordinary, I think, is the willingness and openness of other people to educate me. Um, to the point of, of you know, um, talking to a boss and, and saying, all right, what are the verbs doing here? And him having to explain then, well, in Arabic, verbs work this way, or the pronouns can shift in a different way. Um, so a lot of it is that willingness to say, all right, we're not going to recreate the poem as the poem in a new language. We're gonna recreate something that hopefully resonates in the same way. Um, the poem that I just read, we debated about the roosters and, and what was trying to be communicated. And I had to ask him, you know, give me the cultural context, you know, um, are there rooster fights? How are they done? Who does them and where? And he had to kind of explain the rest of it to understand how the, the bloodletting of the roosters was a symbol of kind of male aggression against other males. Um, and he said, well, you haven't, you haven't used the same words in the original, but you've conveyed the idea. And so realizing that we can communicate not identical things because we're not in the same language. There is no way to reproduce that but that we can create some similar effect. Um, and to do that, it's a real back and forth. So I realized pretty early on, I couldn't get very far on my own. I could take what somebody had given me, I could you know, make it more poetic, but I had no idea if it was accurate to the original. So I realized it really had to be this negotiation where we had to go back and forth. Um, and so people that I work with, I say, you have to be willing to, <laughs> to educate me and, and slow down because I'm going to get it wrong um, and spend that time doing that. Um, the great risk is that I get it wrong and that you know, someone will, will call me out and say, you know, you totally misinterpreted this. Um, I am trusting the people that speak both in Arabic and English to be able to catch me and steer me in the right direction. But they're really versions uh, even to call it co-translation, it seems a bit of a stretch because it's this dance we're doing with language to try and convey something of the original in a new language. Um, there's a great joy in that. It's opened me up to different ways of expression. I use repetition much more than I ever used to because of reading so much Arabic poetry. Um, the bravery and the metaphoric jumps that someone like Kadan makes um, just kind of astonish me. So that's the great joy for me. I know I'm learning a lot through the process. Uh, the risk is that I impose myself on it, that I'm not empty enough to really listen well, that, um, you know, I, I would hate it that people would, would read my books and not go and look up the actual Arabic poets I'm referencing. <laughs> Um, ideally, it starts the interest in really understanding. There's some great books, uh, even translating to English. Um, Frankenstein in Baghdad is an incredible novel that everyone should read. Um, so if it can be a door into further opening up and listening to more voices and getting them out, then I think that's the good. Uh, the risk is that, you know, uh, I get paid attention to and not the Iraqis who really need the attention and assistance, um, particularly now, not not only are they dealing with you know uh, the post invasion, but they're dealing with protest against corruption in their government, um, brutal suppression, and then on top of it, COVID, with very little relief and vaccinations being offered to people in Iraq. Um, so it's it's very tough to hear those stories, but I think really necessary for us in our comfortable Western shoes to listen to them.
Definitely. And I want to thank you for being one of the voices that echo these unheard screams that stay in the chamber over there. Yeah. I want to, as someone who had lived in multiple cultures myself and got to experience different parts of the world, I am finding a great joy in my life today when I see things from people who I've considered completely foreign to me, um, when I find things just in the details very much in common between the two of us. Mm. And as an example, I remember a few years ago, I had met a, I was on a pilgrimage in Europe and I met a, an Irish man who was walking the pilgrimage in the name of his a brother who had passed away from a disease and he was doing it under his name to earn him the good deeds of walking it. Mm. And that is a, a something that we do in Iraq and in, within Muslim culture. Um, people do it for their loved ones after they pass away. And I just thought that that was something just so exclusive to us. Mm. And I was, you know, delighted and very shocked when I, when I saw that it was common also in, in Irish culture. For you, for, with, with these experiences, what are some of the strongest bridges you've seen or situations? The setting may look different, the colors may look different, the language may sound different, but what has been like corely in common between the two different environments that you're experiencing? Um, yeah, I, there are ways I see um, our isolation and our pridefulness as a country and how much we need to wake up to the, the wider spectrum of connections and interconnections in the world. And that goes from the personal in the sense of what you were just talking about, that um, you don't see yourself as an isolated unit or individual, you're part of your family history and the generations before you and the generations after you. And to live in a way to improve that world for others um, and not so focused on yourself seems like a crucial thing that we're moving towards. And I find more and more of my students talking about that, um, how they wanna live their lives. So I see that part of Arabic culture as a crucial kind of uh, a lesson for us in the United States. Um, that's true for you know the Mexican culture too, just this deep sense of rootedness and of connectedness and that your life is one small part of a bigger, a much bigger fabric that's being woven. Um, and, and part of that I think is a spiritual vacuum. There's not that sense of interconnectedness because we, by focusing so much on kind of secular spirit lacking, we've, we've lost that sense um, that there's wider forces at work. Um, Poetry, uh, I, I think, you know, poetry readings are kind of the last bastion of the sacred. They're a place where if it's working well, the word is activating people's memories and connections in an astonishing way. Um, it's like a really good jazz performance, you know? <laughs> it's happening right there, right now. Um, and you can feel it when there's an aliveness to somebody who's really feeling their words. Um, when I read, I was part of Split This Rock uh, a couple years ago, and because of us, Kadeem uh, is now in Washington, D.C., uh, we did a panel together. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a Kadem Kanhar poem, and it was about um, a poem about someone who had died and is collecting their body from the morgue. And he read it in Arabic. And I then read it in our English version that we'd created. And I looked over and uh, Abbas is, is just weeping. It's just, the face is all wet. And um, he just looked at the audience and he said, this poet has crystallized what we all have experienced who lived in Iraq during these years. We've all gone through some version of this. And that seemed astonishing to me that this room full of people <laughs> We're listening to someone talk about how a poet, a, a poet from his country, had written something that so moved him that it got in contact with his own losses. And that seems to bridge any culture and divide. Um, 
that, that sense of aliveness of language to sorrow and loss and to connection and hope. Um, and that seems like the real gift of poetry when it's working is it, um, it does bridge us all. Oh, you're on mute, Hamza. Thank you. I said, absolutely. And uh, we love bridges too. Um, David, as we're approaching uh, the end of our session here, I, I would like to thank the audience again for staying with us and being part of this conversation. And I would like to encourage every member in the audience, if you have a question or and you'd like to ask or make a comment, uh, please either raise the virtual hand through the Zoom feature or drop a comment in the chat box and we'll bring you on so you could join us. You could turn on your mic, your camera, one or the other, whatever works for you, would like to would love to involve you in the conversation. The more engagement, the better. That's what David and I were, were chatting about before the session started. Um, in the meantime, uh, David, uh, what what poem could you read for us next? I, I'm, I'm being very greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know me, I can always read. Uh, well, I mentioned uh, um, Yusuf Al-Tamimi, and I see in the chat that um, Gazwan uh, knows Yusuf. Um, He's a great person to, to talk to. We've talked about creating a memoir together. I've had him telling me stories and I have a little collection of them. We haven't done as much under COVID. I haven't been out to Utah in a while. Um, I'm hoping I can get to. He's got amazing stories to tell. Um, we stayed up late one night and uh, this is a poem that came out from one of those stories. Um, so I'll share this one. Uh, somebody else, Cheryl asked. Yeah, I, there's a question. Name of the poem. Yeah, the, the poem you shared, it was the last. Well, the first poem was Interrogation. And the second poem was We Iraqis. Uh, we Iraqis was published in Catamaran last year. Um, these other poems will come out when the book gets published from Woodworks Press pretty soon. And it's called Black Butterflies Over Baghdad. Uh, this one is called Lost slash found. Up late with Yusuf Al-Tamimi, former interpreter, now living in Salt Lake City with his family. As the last candles pool, I ask, what's the hardest thing you saw? He'd been called to Camp Taji's main gate about a suspicious package a woman was carrying. When he arrived, she was clutching a crimped over paper bag to her chest and the men were yelling at her with their AKs. He made them stand down, then approach, asked what she had. She slowly unrolled it inside the head of her son. She was asking the American soldiers to help look for the body so she could bury him properly. Yusuf says, as she talked, she continued to stroke her son's hair. Thank you very much. And um, we have Shahed with us who is joining us as a panelist. Shahed, I saw you raise the hand. If you have a question, you're welcome to turn your mic, your camera, whatever is comfortable for you. Feel free to uh, shoot it right up. Hi, everyone. I'll turn on the video so that I'm not just a voice. Hi. Hi, Hamza. Um, I, I was actually very curious about joining because I'm from LA, so not really from the Bay Area, but I'm always, um, I love to be engaged in just thoughtful conversations about many topics. Um, so I just want to thank you, really. It's not a question, it's a comment. Um, I just want to thank you for sharing, uh, for shedding a light on these important topics. I'm Iraqi. Um, I've never been to Iraq and I wasn't even born there. So sadly enough, however, my entire family and my siblings were born and raised in Iraq. And obviously they left due to the war and they experienced, my, my parents experienced some of it. My sisters went back to study there. So they experienced some of the uh, 2003 war. Mm -hmm. And so um, from their stories and everything, it's just always, 
it just has a warm place in my heart, even though I haven't experienced it. And it's so dear to hear other people's stories from my culture and my country. Um, just really spreading the word about things that have happened that I don't feel like, I've, as you guys have mentioned, the media has necessarily shared the true version of, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I find my students know very little. It's, it's wonderful to hear from you. Um, and the Iraqis of the diaspora, I've never seen such a committed group to their country and the specialness of it and talking about, you know, what an Iraqi tomato really tastes like. Um, and that sense that, you know, there is something very special and magical. And when I teach some of these poems to my students now, um, one of the things I, I keep saying is, you know, this is not, they say, oh, this, you know, kind of backward country. It's like, no, this was one of the most literate places in the Middle East, more progressive had been uh, around women's issues um, and kind of astonishing architecture and history. And um, to realize just how little they even know that uh, kind of simple history. Um, you realize how, how far and, and something like a war could have been an opening to understand better, to learn better. Um, uh, I have a friend who teaches at the he teaches Arabic at the military base in Monterey, um, Sitar. And Sitar says half of what he had to teach people was just basic cultural notions of how you enter a house, uh, what hand you use, um, just these basic things. Because he said, you know, we're dealing with very young soldiers, 17, 18 years old, and we're sending them to a place and they have no idea of the depth of the culture um, and, and, and what respect means in a culture like uh, it does in Iraq. Um, so thank you, thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Chad. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, uh, David, there was a question that came through the chat and allow me a second here to read it. Um, could you talk more about being empty enough to translate? Uh, um, Yeah, when, when I read a poem by somebody else, and uh, I'm often reading these things the first time kind of literally just translated into English, um, I'm trying to sense what's happening for the poet and what's happening in the poem. And if I can get that sense, I'm then trying to say, how can I recreate that and, and, and bring it to the fore in English? Um, and to do that, it has to be really about listening to the poet. And, and often these are these conversations, Jamil Al-Jamil, uh, who's in Mosul, uh, Christian who lives in uh, Iraq, a wonderful poet. These surreal, unusual poems, very different from my style but kind of these deeply felt ways of looking at the world. And the more I can listen to him and hear what he's doing within his poem, the more I can get an English that will replicate some of those feelings. Um, so so I, my ideal would be that if you read a poem and that I co-translated, you wouldn't say that's David's poem. <laughs> So if I can do it well enough, each one should be distinct and should be embodied. You know, they should look like, Jamil's poem should look like Jamil's poems, um, even in English. So that's what I mean, really trying to get out of the way, listen to what the poem wants and find the best way to replicate that in English. Um, so that the poet, when, when Jamil reads his poem, he says, "Good, I really like what you did with it. Um, that we get it close enough that it's not about me, it's about him. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it's approaching the poem with a level of empathy that is so high where you separate your own experience and narrative and you just embody it for what it is by the author that wrote it. That's the goal. And I think it's even the goal for my own poems. If I'm really listening well, I'll write that poem and figure out what the poem wants to be and not try to write another poem like I've written before which is part of the risky and scariness of it. If, if I'm writing well, I'm writing outside my comfort zone. <laughs> um, 
We have a, a, a question that came from, and I apologize if I mis mispronounce the name here, uh, Gaius maybe, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, listening to you explain translating poetry really opened my mind to the un untapped dots that come with poetry. I'm from Southern Kaduna, a place in Northern part of Nigeria, one that has experienced the hit of inhumanity. Unlike Iraq, our challenges are not regarded as the war kind, but the number of persons that have died from every herdsman and bandits attack is a call for concern. How can a poet better amp amplify this inhumanity using poetry? I, I think what poets do best is when they're telling those personal stories, whether their own or others and finding images that solidify some feeling. And so to not um, be trying to teach anyone anything, but show them what's happening is the most powerful, I think, uh, way that poetry communicates. Um, a didactic poem tries to teach you and often it doesn't because we're resistant to it. But if you tell us a story and that story has details with it that we can't separate ourselves from, even though it's another culture, another language, another whole series of events, those stories get through. And I think it's a, a, like a really great novel can do that for you. Um, and a great poem can too. It, it pulls you in and it, it lowers your defenses. And once you allow it in, your, your tears and your ways of responding, um, you know, reading some of these poems, um, I have cried at some of the poems just as, as you know, listening to Kadam and what he's gone through. Um, he's found these words for it that are just astonishing. Um, so that's what I would say, tell the stories and tell them in the most impactful language and imagery you can, because that's what's going to get through. And then, you know, they can look it up later <laughs> and find the details. They need to feel first to really start caring. Absolutely. There, there's a, a lot of attention that, that could get paid to a poem or a piece of art if it packs a lot of emotion and power behind the feelings behind it. David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. As we wrap up, I'm going to go back into my greedy nature and ask for one last poem, please, of your choice. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Hamza, for, for creating this space um, and everybody for, for showing up and, and listening and commenting. I really appreciate it. I'm going to read the first poem in the book, A Black Butterflies Over Baghdad. It's called Mosul Birthday, and it's based on a photograph that an Iraqi friend sent me. And so this, in some ways, is about being an external looker and moving into a place of great suffering and trauma. Um, and kind of questioning that process. Mosul birthday. Come to these rooms festooned with light. See how they've removed the roofs and most of the walls. Birthday streamers are draped high enough to avoid entanglement and balloons bounce in winds. The blast popped only a few. Pull one down See how long you and your documentary crew can keep it aloft. The floor's cracked plates could cut your feet. Even the number of bodies is well hidden, except from those who knew their names, accepted Amal's birthday invitation. Where's the boy who was born on this day? He's that mark on the far wall beneath the black balloon. Never knew what hit him. Elegant to have those who would have mourned hardest die with him. David Sullivan, thank you very much. Our audience, thank you very much for joining us and making time to be part of this conversation. It made the conversation that I got to have with David even more rich and more meaningful to me. Really appreciate it. This session has been recorded and the replay will be available uh, for viewing tomorrow. Thank you very much again, David, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Hamza, I appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for showing up.
Absolutely. Thank you.